one of the cases of crimes against humanity which our own government and, and our public have not acknowledged or taken steps to provide relief or justice to the sufferers is the mob attack on Christians 10 years ago in Kandamal. That killed more than 100 Christians, destroyed their homes, schools, churches, and made thousands of them homeless. Similarly, the United States has never acknowledged the outbreak of lynchings of black Americans in the American South in the early part of the 20th century. What makes people behave in this way? What makes such crimes possible? How can they be committed on this scale and repeatedly and then be brushed aside or forgotten or treated as justifiable? This is an interesting question politically and psychologically for us to think about in view of what is happening here. A philosophy professor at Yale University, Dr. Jason Stanley, has made a study of why and how such a situation of intolerance and right-wing extremism has arisen in different countries across the world and is making itself felt today. He's written about in a book called How Propaganda Works and a second book which I think might have been published by now called How Fascism Works. He says that first the ground has to be prepared so that a mood can be created that makes hatred and violence acceptable to society. And there is a standard formula by which this is accomplished. And it is a formula that is common to all such breakdowns of democracy, wherever they have occurred and are now occurring. And the method is as follows. Number one, the values of liberty and equality have to be replaced by authority and hierarchy hierarchy which is ethnic or religious or gender based. The dominant group, which means the majority community, has to be made to feel that it is being victimized by minority groups. This is what builds up a mood of hysteria against minorities and against socialism and communism. In this atmosphere, the nation's leader and the military are glorified and dissenters are treated harshly. Secondly, the truth has to be destroyed. And this is done by spreading a fear of so-called outsiders and so-called enemies of the state. And this is done by appealing to emotions and cutting out all rational debate. Conspiracy theories are manufactured and an irrational fear is let loose. And when this happens, there is a complete breakdown of the truth. A myth has taken its place. And this is how Professor Stanley describes the myth that replaces the truth. He says, it is the myth of a glorious bygone era where the nation was supposedly ethnically or religiously pure and rural patriarchal values reigned supreme. That's the myth. Well, our groups are represented as threats to the dominant culture and its men are cast as criminals or sexual predators." Unquote. 
Well, this myth places one ethnic group over others, it places men over women, and it places all opposition as anti-national. On this well-prepared ground, the mood that has been built up in society sanctions all kinds of behavior that would not be acceptable otherwise. And obviously then there is no place for liberty, equality or democracy or the give and take of democratic politics. Well, in a chilling conclusion, the professor says, quote, history shows that such propaganda <coughs> licenses extreme brutality. One recent example about a month ago came from Germany, where, where a Syrian migrant was attacked by three men in a park and whipped with an iron chain. And Germany has seen the biggest riot against outsiders in 26 years, where the rioters have given the Hitler salute and hurled missiles. So Hitler worship now celebrates the most terrible era in Germany, German history. I think what should deeply disturb us is how accurately Professor Stanley's analysis explains what's happening here. At a time when human rights are in such poor shape in India, let me acknowledge the debt that we owe to the contribution of an Indian woman, Hansa Mehta, to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. There was no such concept as human rights at all until the end of the Second World War. And for the non-Western world, with large chunks of it under colonial rule, there was no question of any rights at all. It was because of the atrocities committed during the Second World War and during the period leading up to it that the concept was finally addressed. Hansa Mehta had been one of the 15 women who had helped to shape the Indian constitution. And it was her absolute insistence on sexual equality that influenced the language of our constitution. She had been a trailblazer in the field of women's rights in India and had been part of a committee to draft the Hindu Code Bill, which, as we know, was a major reform after independence, and it had a major impact on women's lives. As a delegate to the UN Commission on Human Rights in 1947-48, it was Hansa Mehta who changed the phrase, all men are born free and equal, to all human beings are born free and equal. Well, it took a woman to realize that this change of wording was crucial if whole societies were to be shaken out of masculine dominance. And to go further back, it is the determined struggle of Indian women reformers fighting for equality since the 19th century onward not just for women's rights, but against the cruelties and injustices of caste that has brought us to where we stand today. And of course, the fight is far from over. Under religious fundamentalism, the minorities here are feeling hunted. The poor and helpless among them, some of whom have been driven out of their villages and homes and jobs live in terror. And India is no longer safe for its women. I have spoken as a Hindu, and I am one of millions of Indians of different faiths who practice their different religions. As independence, our founding fathers 
had the wisdom to respect this diversity and to declare India secular and democratic. Democracy to guarantee equal citizenship with equal rights and secularism to provide the space and fresh air for the practice of all religions and different ways of life and thought. No other nation in the world gave its people democracy before development, or its women the right to vote at the very start of nationhood. And no other country has achieved the multicultural miracle that is the meaning of Indian civilization. There is no room for religious fundamentalism among us. It is an insult to religion. It is a danger to all who disagree with it. And it is a frontal attack on our constitution. Thank you for listening.